Um, good evening and welcome uh, to this Leeds Law Society event uh, to meet some BPC judges uh, and others uh, in Leeds in these COVID times. Uh, may I start, uh, as on airline flights, if anyone remembers those, with some initial announcements. Um, first of all, I hope that you can self-locate your emergency exits. Uh, due to technical limitations, uh, I cannot assist you yet, uh, although the new cloud platform may assist in due course. Uh, secondly, your microphones uh, and videos have, I think, uh, been muted uh, or turned off respectively. Um, I'm afraid that we are unable uh, to offer the sort of social interaction that we usually have at Leeds Law Society events, um, but I'm hoping there will be a large party uh, when the restrictions are sufficiently lifted. Um, thirdly, although some questions have been put by email, you're welcome to put further questions uh, during the course of the uh, event by using the question and answer button, uh, which should be visible uh, wherever the limited options available to you are placed. Uh, it may be that it's the bottom or the side of your screen or someone else, and you may have to use the pointer to locate them. Uh, neither the hands up uh, nor the chat feature uh, are being monitored. So please do not use them for the purposes of asking questions. Uh, the questions are being collated by subject matter uh, and as many as possible will be put to the panel at the end of the event, uh, so far as time allows. Um, apologies in advance if time runs out or some specific question uh, is not chosen. Um, thirdly, the event is being recorded uh, and may be made available, or well, I think it will be made available by Leeds Law Society um, after the event. Um, I turn now to thank yous. Um, it's always important to get these in as soon as possible before I'm cut off. Um, first, I'd like to thank Leeds Law Society for putting on the event uh, and carrying out the administration, uh, especially Sue Harris and Catherine Woodward, who are also dealing with the questions, uh, and Rachel Windle, who's done a lot of unseen hard work behind the scenes. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank Virtual Approval Limited, uh, and Rachel Locke, the director, who is managing the Zoom platform for us this evening. Uh, virtual Approval managed various events uh, worldwide, as well as in this country, um, including uh, meetings, uh, arbitrations and court hearings, uh, especially where video platforms are involved, uh, and their experience is well worth drawing upon if you have a remote trial and need some advice or assistance. Um, thirdly, I'd like to thank the uh, panel of speakers, um, who I will now briefly introduce uh, in the context also of explaining the proposed format of the event. The focus is primarily on how the BPCs, or Business Property Courts in Leeds, have been uh, and continue to function during the current COVID pandemic. Um, turning to the format then for this evening, um, I will start the event. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the currently two full-time BPC judges in Leeds uh, and have been here since December uh, 2016. Um, I will be followed by His Honour Judge Klein, uh, the, who, like the other panel members, uh, needs no introduction, but nevertheless will receive a very brief one. Uh, having been in a very successful practice in the, at the bar for many years in Leeds, uh, he became a BPC judge with particular responsibility for the Circuit Commercial Court uh, in early 2017. Uh, district Judge Pima will then speak to the position from the perspective of the district judges. Uh, in addition, he will speak from his experience in his role as what I call top IT judge in charge of IT in the Northeast, or Titjit Northeast for short, or as I think it's more prosaically put, IT liaison judge for the Northeast. Uh, Lisa Linklater, followed by Eleanor Temple, will then deal with their experiences and tips uh, regarding preparation for uh, and participation in remote hearings uh, and indeed the judges conducting them. Uh, again, they are both well known to you as leading barristers uh, in the field of work covered by the Business and Property Courts. Uh, Lisa is also a member of the advisory board of the Centre for Business Law and Practice at the University of Leeds. Uh, and Eleanor is Chair of R3 for the Yorkshire Region, Chair of the Northeast Circuit Commercial Bar Association, uh, and sits regularly as a Recorder and Deputy District Judge uh, on the circuit. Uh, finally, Andrew Horton of DLA Piper in Leeds uh, will speak to the changing landscape of litigation. Uh, Andrew is, uh, is, I'm sure, known to most of you. 
uh, regarding his 30 and more years uh, experience in banking and finance litigation, I think I'm most envious uh, of him for arresting a luxury yacht in the south of France, the sort of job assignment we all pine for. Uh, following Andrew, we hope that there'll be time for a short question and answer uh, session. Uh, having introduced the format, um, I can now turn to my role uh, in my capacity as a speaker on the panel. Um, there are three broad topics that I would like to uh, cover. First, cooperation. Uh, secondly, existing hearings. Uh, and thirdly, urgent applications. So then, cooperation. Uh, as judges, we are extremely grateful to the staff of the court, but also to all of you lawyers for all the work that you have put into making hearings work uh, and enabling the court to continue to function uh, and provide local justice uh, in these difficult times. Uh, we are aware that the COVID pandemic has uh, been a fast changing roller coaster experience, uh, requiring constant change and innovation, uh, both at your end and ours, uh, in order to keep things going. Uh, the court staff have been at the centre of things, uh, and if things have not always gone uh, as, as well as expected, um, I hope that you'll be patient with them uh, and bear in mind the very real difficulties uh, that they are working under. Uh, so far as the legal profession is concerned, more than ever before, there has been a surge in cooperation, uh, both with other parties uh, and with the court. Uh, more than anything else, uh, I should stress the importance of early communication to identify whether there are practical problems, and if so, whether they're capable of being resolved. Uh, in particular, I have been impressed with the offers of offices and technology uh, by firms of solicitors to other parties uh, where there have been problems, uh, particularly in the case of litigants uh, in person. Uh, my second topic uh, is existing hearings. Uh, before I turn to that in more detail, I should say that, as you will all know, the Leeds Combined Court Centre has a number of features, uh, which mean that it is not the best court building in England for the work of the business and property courts. Uh, the inadequacies of the building have, it might be said, uh, been highlighted uh, and exacerbated by the current health position. Uh, courtrooms are now slowly being brought back into use, uh, but the full range of courtrooms is not capable of being used, uh, and there will obviously be competition between the jurisdictions for use of those room, courtrooms that are in use. Um, under current social uh, distancing rules, uh, the courts that are available uh, can only accommodate about seven to nine individuals, uh, in addition to the judge and clerk. Uh, for some time, therefore, it is unlikely in Leeds uh, that normal face-to-face -face hearings uh, will be anything other than the exception. Uh, we, like you, wait to see whether the so-called Nightingale courtrooms uh, will come into our existence uh, and be a feature of life uh, in the near future. Uh, as regards existing hearings, we are trying on a rolling basis to review the cases and contact the parties uh, to see whether the hearing will be capable of going ahead and on what basis. Um, it should be borne in mind that um, uh, there are a, a variety of possibilities. Um, it would help us uh, if you could yourselves initiate inter-party discussions at an early stage uh, without waiting for the court to raise the issue. Uh, my third and final topic uh, is urgent hearings. Uh, to some extent, my comments are general, uh, not limited to the COVID situation. Uh, as regards interim hearings in Leeds, uh, we have recently issued uh, a note and an accompanying form. Uh, we would be grateful if the form could be completed and provided with the papers uh, when an urgent hearing before a circuit judge is being sought. Uh, these documents are available on the uh, Leeds Law Society website. Uh, the form is particularly directed at the following three matters, uh, although there are others. First, the level of urgency. Uh, all too often it is unclear what level of urgency there is asserted to be uh, without reading the entire evidence and the judge having to come to his or her own view. Secondly, uh, without notice applications. 
another all too common feature seems to be a request for a without notice decision on the papers. Uh, without notice applications are exceptional uh, and grounds properly have to uh, be made out for such uh, a situation. Normally, that to give notice would defeat the interim relief being sought. Thirdly, communication and cooperation with the other side. Uh, in many cases, there is no reason why the draft application and evidence cannot be provided to the other side in advance of approaching the court. Uh, discussions can then take place with a view to agreeing interim relief, if appropriate, and a timetable for evidence. This can save unnecessary hearings. Even if agreement cannot be reached, uh, such discussions can assist the parties in identifying where the procedural disputes lie and the positions taken by each party on them and the reasons for those decisions. Now, other than to say that I have been surprised at how well remote hearings have, in general, worked, and to find out that an electronic bundle is something that I can grapple with, um, that is all I'm proposing to say at this stage. Uh, I will now pass over to uh, His Honour Judge Klein, who will be able to give you an invaluable insight uh, into remote hearings. Thank you. Um, having uh, participated in a number of multi-day hearings, including trials since the COVID-19 pandemic began, in the short time allotted to me, I propose to discuss two broad themes. Uh, first, remote trials and what I've learned from conducting them. And secondly, how you can prepare for how you can prepare bundles to best assist the court. Picking up on something Judge Davis White has emphasized, the message I want to leave you with at the beginning of this um, short talk is this. I too have been really impressed with the level of cooperation since the pandemic began between practitioners who use our courts, between those practitioners and the court's administration, and between those practitioners and the judiciary. Uh, and I am grateful to you. That cooperation has allowed Judge Davis White uh, and me to run a court at almost full capacity. By way of example, since the middle of March, I have only adjourned two hearings that were in my list. One, because a litigant in person was unable to participate at all because of his personal circumstances, and the other because, for various reasons, some unrelated to the pandemic, the trial time estimates had, been incre had increased from six days to ten days, and the extra time couldn't be accommodated so close to trial. That is a real achievement, dare I say it, particularly when compared to other jurisdictions, which to a large degree is thanks to your efforts. So, Thank you, and uh, long may that cooperation continue. Uh, now to trials. There will be some commercial cases when a remote trial is not appropriate, where, for example, because the allegations made are so serious, it is right and just that accused and accused, so to speak, should be in the same room and able to look at one another. But a substantially greater proportion of commercial cases are capable of being conducted remotely in a way that ensures the trials remain fair and that justice continues to be served. <clears throat> My own experience is that remote trials and other multi-day hearings do take longer than face-to-face -face hearings. I think that, that there are two reasons for that. First, time needs to be built in for the inevitable technical glitches and for new participants to join the hearing and for, the for, and for former participants, mainly witnesses, to leave. You can lower the risk of technical glitches by testing your systems and connections before the hearing begins. There is no reason why you cannot liaise with the court and your opponent to arrange a trial run of your technology. Um, secondly, because advocates have a much smaller view of the judge, they are less alive to the non-verbal indications that they need to slow down so that the judge can complete his note taking. It is easy for an advocate to see a judge busily scribbling away in court. Advocates, or at least some of them, are much less conscious of that in a remote trial. So I've tended to find myself shouting stop at not infrequent intervals. A tip for you all. Um, from my observation of an advocate in a recent multi-day hearing observing me, she worked out that when she saw me on screen with my head down, in fact, what I was doing was writing furiously and so she waited for the next few seconds until I looked up again before moving on to the next question. 
that made my life immeasurably easier. Uh, my own experience is that remote trials and other multi-day hearings are not in themselves uh, more physically demanding than face-to-face -face hearings. Uh, like many of you, I imagine, my mind tends to wander in remote hearings, in, re in remote meetings, uh, and I'm prone to check my emails, as most of you are too, or carry on with uh, other work. Um, that is the case in remote meetings, but I found myself just as engaged in remote trials and face to and remote hearings uh, as in face to face hearings. Uh, I'm helped by the fact that at circuit judge level, at least, we are very lucky to have competent and engaging advocates before us most, if not all of the time. Uh, but I'm also helped by the technology and equipment I have procured and which has been provided to me. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have very good internet connection. I have two large monitors. I use good quality but somewhat unattractive headphones throughout the hearing so that the audio quality is as good as it can be. I work in a quiet room with no distractions. My phone is turned off and I disconnect my email account once the hearing starts. Uh, and I have a relatively comfortable uh, ergonomic chair. All these things which I hope you have and techniques which I hope you adopt do make a remote hearing as immediate in my experience as a face-to-face -face hearing. Uh, and I'm helped also by the quality of the bundles. Uh, different judges have different preferences about hearing bundles. That may be because the work we all do differs. Uh, what I propose to talk about now is the form of bundles which is most helpful at circuit judge level. I'm aware that the BPC district judges may take a different approach. I, I recognize that different, approaches can, that different approaches can present you with difficulties, but ultimately it is in everyone's interest that hearings are fair and run efficiently and following judicial preferences, which are determined uh, in our case by the nature of the work we, we respectively do, does support that objective. Uh, those of you who have heard me speak before or who have been participants in CCMCs I've conducted uh, know that I am a proponent of electronic bundles if they are first rate. Uh, whilst we are working remotely, there is an expectation that bundles will be electronic, although I have to say, based on recent experience, uh, uh, that for witness actions, it is generally more efficient to have paper bundles as well at least as a backup to the electronic bundle. Uh, there is a small, a very small minority of practitioners who claim that they do not have the facilities to procure electronic, to produce electronic bundles. Uh, I struggle to accept that, I confess. There can only be a handful of solicitors who do BPC work who do not use electronic case management systems. So the production of electronic bundles should be easier than the production of paper bundles, or at least that is the theory. The direction of travel in all commercial spheres, I'm sure you'd agree, is to more electronic working. And so if you are one of the handful of solicitors without an electronic case management system, you need to think carefully about how you're going to be able to offer a first rate service in the future to your customers. <clears throat> and cost is not or should not be an issue. I'm no advocate for one commercial package over any other, but by way of example, a great many judges have been provided with PDF Exchange Editor as a document management package. It is an alternative to another well-known commercial package, Adobe Acrobat DC or Pro, with which many of you are likely to be familiar. Uh, an evaluation copy of PDF Exchange Editor is free on the internet as far as I'm aware. And a purchase package with a license for five court users cost, as at this afternoon, about £150. With a license and, a, and a package with a license for 100 users cost about £1,300, uh, which uh, 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 I suggest is a, a small amount um, for um, a, a system uh, that is going to be used probably uh, frequently in the future. Uh, and there are, uh, as I've indicated, other proprietary packages available, um, uh, which I assume uh, uh, have a similar cost, um, uh, and similar, uh, uh, which have similar pricing. 
Uh, so what is a first rate bundle? Uh, I recognize uh, that I am prescriptive about the form of electronic bundle and uh, I'm aware that my orders in relation to electronic bundles are, um, uh, as one practitioner described uh, them, uh, uh, them to me politely, comprehensive. But that is only because from experience, for the sort of work that Judge Davis White and I do, the form I advocate it is most useful to me and is the easiest for all the other participants to use. Uh, that is why I tend to order in multi-day cases that an electronic bundle must be a single PDF, be fully bookmarked with each bookmark containing the page number of the bookmark page amongst other details, if convenient, have a hyperlinked index, be fully paginated in a way that ensures that the electronic pagination is the same as the pagination displayed on the hearing bundle pages. Uh, which I'm sure you'll appreciate is likely to require the index to be paginated. It is um, uh, uh, frustrating and uh, unhelpful if um, uh, when an advocate refer refers to page 79, uh, what uh, he or she is referring to is page 79 uh, it, uh, as indicated on the paper pagination um, uh, where the page is uh, uh, in the electronic bundle at, uh, say, for example, page 84. Uh, the bundles uh, uh, should, uh, by my orders, be fully editable and have been subject to OCR, that is optical character recognition, before filed at court, and be prepared so that the default view when a document is opened is 100%. Pages should be displayed so that they don't need to be rotated uh, and it goes without saying, and this is a point often repeated and with which you'll be familiar, bundles should only contain essential documents. Uh, in this way, what all the participants should have is a true electronic version of a paper bundle. Now, to be clear, I'm not wedded to that particular form of bundle. If in a particular case, a solicitor has an alternative proposal, which they think is a better solution, and they should let us know early in the trial preparation so that we can consider the proposal. So to end where I began, I recognize the pressures you are all under and that having to prepare electronic bundles could well add to those pressures. But I think that with some uh, long-term thinking from you and co cooperation between all of us, we can continue to deliver a top quality service to BPC court users. Thank you. I think we'll now hear from District Judge Pima who, as Judge Davis Weiss explained, is one of our BPC district judges, and I'm told the regional IT liaison judge for the Northeastern Circuit. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I'm just going to touch upon a few things that come from the um, district judge point of view, um, and then I'm going to touch upon the advancements or the upcoming. Um, enrolment into the CVP programme and uh, hopefully uh, give some insight into what that's going to do. Um, so far as the uh, district judges are concerned, um, we were faced with the immediate problem when COVID um, lockdown struck with a, a great deal of uh, adjournments whilst we got the remote working set up. Um, but by and large, um, the majority of those hearings have either been relisted and heard um, or have been deemed by the parties and accepted by the court as being unacceptable to be heard by remote means at the time being. As has been already identified, we will be having um, some forms of hybrid or perhaps um, in urgent cases or uh, um, essential cases, face-to-face -face hearing, but they will be uh, unusual. At present, um, as far as the BPC um, district judges are concerned, um, we are able to list and deal with all manner of cases that we were able to deal with um, prior to the COVID crisis with obviously those uh, exceptions. Um, we hope that we will be able to list um, anything that you want um, in the usual way and provide that service. Um, we are, I think, I think I've been asked by all of the BPC district judges to highlight a couple of things about this. The first is, um, has been touched on, is, is time estimates. Um, it's necessary, um, certainly in my experience, for the reading, and I'll touch very quickly on bundles in a minute as far as the district judges are concerned, um, that reading takes a, a longer. 
um, electronically. It simply does. Um, it, it, it just takes a, a little bit. It takes longer for it to get into your head. It takes longer to sort it out and it just requires more preparation. Um, certainly my experience is that I think I need to be in a, a greater state of preparation uh, than when you have a paper bundle. So when we ask for time estimates, um, we encourage you to think about what we're going to need to read and think about how long it's going to be a bit more carefully than um, we did before. In terms of hearing times, um, it's my experience that hearings do take longer. Um, leaving aside the technical issues, which we're all aware of and uh, you, you have to factor into, and I'll come back to, um, it's important to note that things just take that bit longer because it's simply the, the nature of the beast. And therefore, um, it's important that people don't underestimate how long it takes. We appreciate that people think if we give a shorter time estimate, we might get in earlier. There may be some truth in that, but to some extent, um, you're making life more difficult for everybody. We'd rather you gave a, a true estimate and we will find a way to, to, to make sure it works. Um, we, as I think Jonathan has pointed out, uh, we hope we are adjourning very, very little. And we're providing, I hope, uh, almost all the service that we were able to provide um, pre-COVID. Um, in terms of, for the district judges, in terms of bundles, um, I'll echo what um, uh, Judge Klein has just said about bundles. I, we're not quite as um, prescriptive about things because we appreciate that the, um, there will be cases that aren't as valuable or simply don't have the time for preparation um, or simply aren't worth the additional uh, expenditure to get into a position. But there is a minimum. Um, it is set out, we hope, in the, in the directions. Bookmarks are an absolute minimum. Um, it seems to me that it's just almost impossible to do a hearing properly without proper bookmarks. Um, the match to bundle, um, page match to the bundle and the uh, index is also absolutely essential. I did three hearings today, um, all well-known solicitors, two of the three um, bundles, the pages were nowhere near the actual page in the index and it resulted in lots of tedious running around trying to find the right page and reassessing. It's, it shouldn't be difficult and it really um, does make uh, the hearing much longer. Um, this, the last thing is the essential documents. Um, today's hearings, I can say to you, um, probably only a quarter of the documents were referred to at any point or were relevant in, in my reading. Um, it is really quite important that parties do give thought and careful thought to what documents are actually going to be needed for that application. It might be needed in a wider context, but it isn't necessary um, for the uh, hearing itself. So just please have a, a thought about that. Can I touch on CCMCs um, very briefly? Again, something that I've been asked to communicate from my colleagues as well. Um, it's really important that we get the Excel spreadsheet um, for the composite uh, costs comparison um, in an editable form. Um, my practice, and I know I think District Judge Goldberg does the same thing, and uh, I know some of the others do, is to share my screen with the Excel spreadsheet as we as I talk and as I give my decision, so the parties can see at a glance what we're at, what I'm awarding into which column and where it goes, and everybody then has no difficulty in knowing what has been done. Um, it makes it much, much more um, usable and it cuts down all the arguments later on about what was agreed and what wasn't agreed. So please try to keep that one in there. Um, in terms of uh, other matters, again, another bugbear that's been pointed out by another of the district judges um, was not receiving word versions of the um, uh, draft orders so that they could um, see and correct anything that they wanted if the majority was agreed. Uh, turning on then to the question of CVP, um, there is a, approximately a 10 day or nine days, I think now, um, uh, rollout for um, the first tranche of extra licenses for which Leeds is getting um, a, a great deal. Um, there is a further rollout of more licenses that will come. CVP will be available to those judges that uh, wish to use it. Um, it's important to note that it is not a solution to everything. Um, it is also not a mandatory requirement for the judge to use it. Certain judges will prefer to use other platforms and they will continue to be able to use them. Um, it may be that as judges continue to use CVP, 
um, they may wish to switch over. It has elements of both Zoom and Teams and elements of Skype for business, um, but it is by no means the, the, the panacea that will solve all your problems. For instance, there is no interpreter channel, um, so therefore it doesn't have any advantage over any of those. There, are no, there is no such thing as breakout rooms at present unless there are spare rooms in which people can be put. And at presently, um, there isn't a mechanism whereby um, the host, the judge, unless they're an administrator, can control uh, some of the uh, things like spotlights, for instance. These things may come in time. However, into, in its advantage, um, it is a much better um, picture quality generally um, than most of them. Um, it is very simple to use and you can access it through a number of different mediums. So for instance, you can contact, you can use Skype for Business and join CVP through it. You can use a telephone and join CVP through it. Um, not that this will apply entirely with BPC, but there is in fact a way to connect to prisons and other form of video facilities, um, link facilities. So it has a wider uh, connection facility, which may prove useful in uh, other formats. Um, there is an app to be used as well, so litigants in person may find it more um, usable as well. Um, that said, we are in the early stages of adoption and we will continue to use it and see where things um, go out. Um, I can say that there should be sufficient licences, um, from what I have been told, for the Business of Property Court to be able to utilise it as and when they, suit, they desire to use it. Um, it seems to me um, that it will be up to the judge to de decide which they think is the most useful, but it may be a case that certain hearings parties may want to come forward and say, we think this format may be better for that. Um, one of the things that CVP does have, uh, and I can speak from having done a trial um, uh, uh, on Friday, um, was when a witness was speaking whilst on, in Skype for business, you can spotlight that person. You can't then at that point see the barrister who's giving the questions. If you leave it in the normal format with a number of people there, the icons are somewhat small, it's hard to pick up the transit. What CVP does allow is what's called two over 21. So the, the top two, the last two people that spoke are highlighted in a, bigger in a bigger window at the top and the rest of the people up to 21 are in smaller icons below. Therefore, the interaction between question and answer from the witness um, is a little bit more natural. Um, so it may be that as we progress um, for trials, for instance, that may become more appropriate. Um, the last thing that I've been asked to um, say is this, on behalf of the judges um, at uh, district judge level, um, we are keen um, where people want us to do things to be contacted. We don't mind being asked, um, can you move this? Can you increase the level? We don't mind the emails coming in to do that. Um, we are here to do what service we can do within the realms of the restrictions that we have for COVID. And therefore, if we can assist, we will. Um, please do try to uh, cooperate. And my, I, will, I will echo what has been said by everybody before, uh, which is that we have been um, incredibly um, pleased to note how well in the broad terms, general uh, terms that solicitors have cooperated and managed to make hearings doable and indeed restricted the issues to those which are the only things that needed to be decided. Uh, and that reflects well upon all those that do this type of work. Um, and it really does make a difference to us um, who are having to make these decisions. I, 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 like all the others, are doing it entirely remotely and therefore do um, depend a great deal upon the quality of presentation and um, for that I am grateful. I think next you're going to hear from both uh, Eleanor Temple and Lisa Link later. I think Lisa is going to go first. Have we lost Lisa? She's, uh, we, we can't hear you, Lisa. Uh, I'm going to speak for five minutes about pre-trial preparation. I've just taken part as counsel in a remote High Court trial, uh, which lasted for seven days. 
it was a commercial court trial before his honour judge Klein, sitting as a high court judge in the business and property courts in Leeds. The trial involved both factual and expert witnesses and took place by Skype for Business. I'm going to focus upon three aspects of pre-trial preparation and share those recent experiences with you. Uh, the first is establishing lines of communication within your legal team. Uh, the second is pre-trial review directions and actions following the pre-trial review. And finally, I will share some practical points in preparing to be the advocate at the hearing. So starting first with establishing lines of communication within the legal team. Uh, in any trial, there are going to be pressures, but there are particular pressures in doing something new, such as a remote trial. And it is vital, in my view, to establish really good lines of communication within the legal team right from the outset. This really helps to build a positive team and helps to carry everybody through this new situation. Uh, what we did in our case was we shared mobile and home phone numbers early on. And we also used Microsoft Teams very effectively. What we did was we set up a team with everybody involved in the legal team. Uh, if you use Microsoft Teams, there is a chat function. And if you're acting as the advocate in the case, it is an extremely good way of getting instructions instantaneously. Uh, the setup I had was I had my desktop with two monitors and then I used a laptop to work with Microsoft Teams during the trial and that worked very well for me but we will each find our own ways of working and I'm sure in a different legal team there might be preferences for different software applications. We also at a very early stage scheduled video meetings at a specific time before and after court with the client, of course, apart from the times when the client was giving evidence. This established a really good routine from the start and I think it was very reassuring for the client when we were working remotely. And again, that worked extremely well with for us in this particular case in terms of communicating between ourselves and I think it reduced everybody's stress levels and I hope helped everybody perform at their best during this new situation. Uh, moving then to pre-trial review directions, uh, we were extremely fortunate that the judge had thought through so many points that might arise on the remote trial. And we had a very detailed order after the pre-trial review that give, gave us an excellent framework to work from moving forwards. And as has been the theme of tonight, cooperation between counsel and between solicitors was very, very important. The other point I would mention is that there are some different steps that need to be taken compared to an in-person trial. Uh, so just very briefly points to think about the trial timetable. We had a break each morning and afternoon. We had a break between changes of witnesses. So these are points that need to be built into the trial timetable. Uh, when preparing the list of participants, that's done quite some time in advance, at least a week in advance. And some of the participants will naturally be the solicitors, counsel, witnesses. But in our case, we also involved our commercial pupil in chambers. Uh, in a law firm, you might want to involve trainees, apprentices, and it can provide very valuable trial experience uh, for those involved. So they need to be added to the list of participants as well. Witnesses and organising witnesses are, is a really important area for solicitors. And I would note in particular, bundles has been mentioned. Thinking through getting uh, bundles to witnesses is important because of course, if you're in an in-person trial, you just have one set of bundles for the witness and you don't need to worry about any more. That all needs to be done. 
uh, in preparation. Preparing witnesses to join the hearing is also very important together with testing. Uh, we had done that uh, using the HMCTS guidance, which is very helpful, and making sure that each witness was able to download Skype for Business. Uh, moving briefly then, in conclusion, to practical points if you're acting as the advocate. Uh, you do need to think through your technology in advance. I think I had a plan A, plan B and plan C. I found using an Ethernet stabilised the internet connection. It was very easy to set up. And I was also reliant upon uh, the support from my family in terms of bandwidth. So that was also important during the trial. And I think also it is worth thinking through if you're the advocate acoustics, uh, because that is very important. Uh, this has been a very brief talk, but if anybody would like to discuss preparation for a remote trial with me further, I will be only too happy to do that. And please do get in touch. Thank you. I'm now going to hand over to Eleanor Temple. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm going to relive some of the successes and challenges of what was a very early remote High Court trial. Um, originally listed for five days, including judicial reading, to start on the 27th of March. So you can already see uh, the difficulties with that. Um, we had a, a rather creative and perhaps sorcerous um, initial hearing whereby that trial was shoehorned into two days in April and then inevitably we had another two days in May and we're about to pick up judgment at the start of July. So there's already a clue really as to one of the obstacles that I think there is uh, that needs to be overcome in relation to the arrangements for a role, uh, remote trial in that introduction. My experience of that trial and some of the other remote hearings that I've been involved in is that there isn't really an off the shelf solution or approach as to how best to run a remote trial or hearing. Um, but it's also my experience that the judges are as flexible as is required to suit the particular case. So the key messages that I want to deliver in my short talk are the need for communication, cooperation, flexibility, and where, where appropriate, as ever, a good sense of humour. So here are my top three tips for dealing with a remote trial. My first top tip is to retain the formality. It sounds obvious, but dress for court. Uh, do not comment, however tempting, uh, as happened to me in one of my cases, upon the choice of the judge's tie uh, or anybody else's clothing for that matter. Um, you may have heard of advocates in the States uh, appearing during lockdown shirtless, or one of them apparently was even still in bed. Uh, clearly, none of that will do. Um, in all seriousness, seriousness though it's really important for your clients um, especially those who haven't appeared in court before and certainly not a remote court to understand the need to respect the proceedings the participants and to remember where they are um, the camera does see more of the room than you expect and body language is captured um, all of it on the screen the judge and the participants in the case have a zoomed in view of eye rolls, head shakes, uh, and at times sheer panic, whether that be from the witnesses or opposing counsel. And I think witnesses need to be reminded, as tempting as it might be in this online forum, that chatting to one's opponent who is about to cross-examine them as if they were old friends or even the judge um, does not really set them in the best position or frame of mind for their impending cross-examination because Let's face it, however smoothly the trap may be set, um, cross-examination is designed to wrong foot the witness about some oral aspects of their case. Um, your clients as witnesses are not there to make lifelong friends. So communicate that in advance to your witnesses and clients because once it's happening during the pre-hearing period, the opportunity to bring your client back to the job in hand uh, may be lost. Don't have a client who is ducking under the desk. Um, if they're using physical bundles as well as electronic bundles um, and they have to retrieve a bundle, have a practice, make sure they have sufficient space. Um, lots of solicitors are now setting up virtual courtrooms in their offices so that solicitors and witnesses can be together even if counsel um, are dialing in remotely. Counsel too, um, in my view, need to be aware of the differences between a remote hearing and a physical hearing. You lose a sense of the room 
you have to rein yourself in, particularly in re-examination. There's nobody there to pull your robe, cough, leap up, stick a note under your nose. Um, and one of my solicitors said that he was shouting into the darkness in a room on his own, don't go there, girl, I can't hear him. And however um, efficient and speedy WhatsApp is, there are some things that you simply lose um, the ability to communicate. And it's important to be aware of that. My second top tip is to ensure the proper, and by that I mean appropriate use of technology. So do remember to use the mic button, mute button, do not unmute. Coughs, doorbells, dishwashers, typing, rustling of papers in one case, even a bark from a stray dog are all unhelpful. Um, make sure the Skype for business call or whatever platform you're on uh, is ended or muted with the video off before joining a Teams or a telephone conference with clients. In the hearing I participated in, I had to message an opponent to say, we can hear you taking instructions. Um, join each call for the hearing early in case there's a connection problem and you have to reset. Um, have e-bundles already downloaded. One of my clients was downloading them as logging on, at the same time as logging on, and there's an issue with bandwidth. You need to have a plan for who to contact if your connection fails, because not, not all the time will the judge notice that you've dropped off the call if you're not speaking. Uh, a plan within the legal team as to who's going to alert the judge or your opponent. Um, and in our case, the judge's clerk was excellent and had made her email available. Um, so that as necessary, she was able to tell everybody that we were reconnecting. And on many occasions, actually, she was required to send a new link. We've heard about WhatsApp and we've heard about Teams. So far as Teams are concerned, I would always recommend having Teams on a separate um, computer from the computer that you're using for the hearing, just in case of communication accidents. Um, and be careful how you deal with WhatsApp. You need to have different groups for the lawyers and the lawyers and the clients. Um, you need to name those groups appropriately and check before you hit send which group you are messaging. Um, you need to remove a client who may be giving evidence from a particular group because you don't want that witness reading all about the things you think they've got wrong um, and how they might make it better in re-examination overnight. Um, and you need to set clear parameters for what WhatsApp is to be used for. Um, and to give you an example, um, I was reading almost verbatim my client's answer to a question posed by the judge only thankfully to stop before reading out aloud um, the following three words, I love you. My final and third top tip um, is not to underestimate the rigours of a remote trial, both in terms of the extra time that's required and I think the effect on your clients and witnesses of not having you in the room with them, um, both pre and post and during the trial. And in my case, one of the witnesses had recently recovered from COVID-19, so was struggling with the tiredness. You need more frequent breaks, more than you might think. And don't make the mistake of just taking them during the period when somebody's connection fails. Um, you also have to be alive to the fact that you will be kicked off the call at some point, And you may not have heard the last however many, many minutes of the hearing. Um, I know that in cases where cost um, allows um, live transcripts and the use of um, new systems such as X bundle um, are being used. That's a, a system whereby you can have the trial bundle shown on a separate Zoom call so that everybody can see the page turned um, at the same time. However, um, in our case, we were stuck with overnight transcripts and left with the judge repeating back what had happened in counsel's absence with requests for counsel to put questions all over again. My experience was that remote trials are more tiring. Um, you and your clients are focused on one or possibly multiple screens with li little opportunity to move around. Uh, and the truth is that sometimes um, as an advocate, you have to be particularly heroic to get the job done. As a part of my remote trial, I uh, on one day cross-examined a witness in the ordinary course in the morning through business Skype, but in the afternoon, due to connectivity problems, I was left cross-examining the witness without being able to see him and without anybody being able to see me. Um, it's a whole other seminar, but I discovered that there is something pretty powerful in the lack of eye-to-eye -eye contact and the control of a witness. Uh, and it does seem to me that where there are allegations of dishonesty, that method of cross-examination would have been wholly unacceptable. I think my um, pupil, Nick Taylor, who is um, on this 
call, um, described it um, in this way. He said, being cross-examined by a disembodied voice is far from ideal, but we made it work. Um, Nick also tells a similar story of logging on during the same cross-examination, only to find that he had no sound. Um, he presumed uh, a break was going on because he could see the judge laughing. Um, then he realised that I was asking questions. Uh, he told me later that he checked the transcript and it was a good joke. So despite the inevitable and varied combinations of technical issues, I think what my experience really speaks to is that the business and property courts and those who practice within them have amply risen to the challenge of this most unexpected situation. And yes, it's true that the trial does lose some of its inherent gravitas and um, some of my tips are designed to restore that. But it also gains a little humanity. Uh, and it's demonstrably clear to me um, that the BPC response to, the, to remote trials um, has been and continues to be excellent. So I'm now going to hand over to Andrew Horton who has been with um, DLA in its various guises for about 31 years, I'm told. Um, so he is pretty well placed to speak to you all about the changing landscape and the effects of the crisis on ADR. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Eleanor. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, I'd just like to spend a few minutes talking about uh, how, in my opinion, the litigation landscape has changed due to COVID-19 and how the use of ADR may assist us going forward. As I've conducted litigation in the least courts and other courts around the country for more than 30 years, um, I'm sure you'll appreciate I've seen quite a lot of change in that time. However, the changes we're seeing at present are entirely different from, uh, from previous changes, such as the introduction of the civil procedure rules and the Jackson reforms, where we had the benefit and the luxury of consultation, forewarning and time to prepare. COVID-19 by necessity has been entirely different. Due to the present situation, the way we do business has changed significantly, and litigation lawyers have had to adapt quite quickly to new ways of working. Since COVID-19 hit the UK with full force in mid-March, there has been a relative lull in disputes activity, although that may be temporary. Statistics show that new claims issued in March and April were more than halved, and there is little to suggest that numbers have increased significantly since then. This may seem a little strange given the major business dis disruption which has occurred, but it could be because clients are dealing with other more pressing matters or that non-essential -legal, non legal spending is seen as a luxury at a time when cash is undoubtedly king. However, as matters settle down and we return to what has been dubbed as the new normal, will we see an upturn in, in, upturn in legal activity? I think it's, it's fairly safe to say in certain areas that we will. Claims for breach of contract for non-performance, which will inevitably be met with uh, arguments of forced mature and, fr and frustration, will be at the forefront, especially following the early rush for advice in these areas. Claims against insurers are likely to increase. Fraud and data security breaches caused by the need to quickly move to remote working may also be a growth area, together with claims against employers for failing to provide safe systems of work. And inevitably, we will eventually see insolvency and other enforcement action arising from the predicted financial decline. One of the positive changes, as I think has been mentioned by all of the speakers so far, has been the increase in the level of cooperation between opposing parties. There will, of course, always be, however, the odd exception. In my experience, solicitors are now more inclined to agree reasonable requests for extensions of time. And this has been assisted greatly by the recent practice direction, allowing parties to agree extensions of time of up to 56 days, which is both helpful and pragmatic in the current environment. There is also a greater level of cooperation between parties and a willingness to work together in relation to such things as agreeing bundles and making arrangements for remote hearings. In general, I believe that parties are currently less adversarial and more willing to cooperate to try and achieve a beneficial solution. And perhaps we're getting back to the type of litigation that Lord Wolfe envisaged when the civil procedure rules were first introduced. Remote hearings either by telephone or video conference are becoming far more common and this should lead to cost benefits as parties can save both the time and cost of travel. Of course the CPR has always included provision for remote hearings but over the years the number of telephone hearings has reduced dramatically from being almost the default position for short hearings and case management conferences in the early noughties to being rarely used until now. 
It would have appeared, despite best efforts, that with the number of courts closed and staff working from home, and with a number of hearings which cannot be accommodated, there will be a backlog of cases in, in a lot of courts. In our experience in the early weeks of lockdown, there was an increased appetite for settlement in ADR, and the reasons for this are purely mainly financial. Claimants are potentially willing to agree a small settlement now, rather than run the risk of incurring further costs of litigation, only then to find the defendant doesn't have the money to pay at the end of the day. Likewise, the defence are probably more inclined to settle now, rather than incur further costs defending the, the claim against the background of uncertainty. Perhaps therefore now, more than ever, is the time to look more at alternative dispute resolution as a means of resolving disputes. Recently, we've seen a renewed focus on ADR within the court system, and although the Civil Justice Council ADR working group stopped short of recommending compulsory ADR, we are all aware of the potential cost consequences of refusing to enter into ADR. Clearly, face-to-face -face mediation is not an option at present, but there has been an increase in parties engaging in remote ADR, and mediators are quickly being trained on how to facilitate a remote mediation. CEDA reports that pre-COVID-19, they were seeing an average of 50 to 60 mediations per month, all of, all of which, with a very rare exception, were face-to-face. In contrast, they're currently seeing over 20 mediations per month, now all being held online, and that figure is sure to increase. Colleagues who have conducted a number of remote mediations in the last few months agree that whilst the experience is not quite the same as face-to-face -face mediation, the process is worthwhile, especially for second mediations, or where the parties are commercial entities and sophisticated users of legal services. Mediating remotely may save costs, as there will be no travel or the need for overnight accommodation. However, there could be an increase in preparation costs, which, which would offset any savings. And the additional benefits to remote mediation could include the possibility of starting earlier in the day, as there's no need to build in time for travel. And as no one has to rush for the last train home, mediations can finish later. So what are our top tips for a successful mediation? Well, try and use a mediator who is experienced in remote mediations and the number of mediators with experience should be growing day on day. Preparation, as always, is key. It's highly likely that pre-mediation discussion with the mediator will be far longer than in face-to-face -face mediations. And it's possible that more than one discussion will be required and that may even involve your clients. Try and ensure there's an early open dialogue with the other parties and the mediator, so as to agree the format, the timings, schedule breaks, attire, and whether even to split the mediation over two days rather than have uh, one long day sat in front of your screen. Ensure the platform that is used allows parties to, put, put a, to be put into separate vir virtual rooms. And this will enable the mediator to hold separate meetings with lawyers uh, or lay clients. Uh, Zoom appears to be the platform of choice for mediations and certainly it has that functionality. And try and test out the technology before the day to iron out any issues, although of course, as we know and as we've heard, that's far from foolproof. And finally, have a draft settlement agreement prepared and agree with the parties how that's going to be executed remotely. This will avoid events at the end of the day, in the event you agree a deal. All of these things should hopefully therefore ensure a smoother process on the day. Although, as I mentioned, the general feeling is that remote mediation is less effective than the face-to-face -face mediation, and the likelihood is that the success rate on the day may not be as high, the process could lead to further discussion and hopefully a solution being found further down the line. And quickly in closing, I'd like to mention another form of ADR which may be worth consideration, early neutral evaluation which it'll, in my view lends itself to the current environment, but has in the past been used quite sparingly. I know that it's supported by the business and property courts, but it, it could also provide a platform for settlement outside litigation. So in closing, I'd just like to thank you for your time, and I'll hand over now to Sue Harris, who I think may have some questions for us. Thank you, Andrew, that's great. Um, yeah, just following on actually from um, your, your mention there of mediation, we've got a question in for the judicial team. Um, have you had experience of parties declining mediation unless and until it can be face to face? Um, this is from Patrick Walker. So he's saying, as a mediator, I'm aware that this approach is being used tactically, for example, by tenants in default. Given the 
that the use of video platforms is proving very effective for both court proceedings and mediations, what message, if any, might the judges send out to parties reluctant to mediate by video? I think um, I volunteered for this one. Um, I, in fact, I've had a hearing today where, in fact, two of the cases today, um, the issue of mediation uh, or ADR uh, remotely was raised. In both cases, um, it, it was taken the point that they didn't want to do it because it wasn't going to be face to face. In one of them, um, they withdrew that objection and, and did it. In the other one, they, did, they, 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 they raised it and I gave a very firm indication. Um, as far as I am concerned, um, there is no good reason um, not to, uh, to involve themselves in mediation uh, by way of video platform, whichever it might be. It seems to me it has advantages over face to face to some extent because um, you don't have to carry on um, uh, being uh, waiting for something to happen. You can carry on doing something else. There's times to be saved. Um, and at the very least, it involves um, parties getting to talk about the issues that might either narrow the trial or resolve it. Um, the steer I gave today was um, a very firm one and uh, in uh, relation, obviously, to the one thing we can deal with, which is in relation to costs. Um, and uh, it, it um, is certainly my view um, that there is no good reason that I've heard so far. There may be very obviously some cases where it won't work, where some party simply has no means um, to uh, participate. Um, it, it seems unlikely, but quite possible, I suppose. Um, but those aside, I can't see any good reason why a mediation uh, undertaken by adequate video facilities um, shouldn't be um, at least attempted um, and should, in my view, in most cases probably be as effective um, as one that is face to face. I do, on saying that, take, I think, um, Eleanor's point quite rightly, that there is an element of um, control, an element of contact that comes when you're speaking to somebody eye to eye that we simply can't do by way of video conferencing and I appreciate that the, the success rate may not be as high um, but there doesn't seem to me a good reason not to try. Thank you very much for that. Um, just the um, another question that came in on the um, Q&A um, and it's actually for you again District Judge Pima um, so with regard to electronic bundles, you mentioned bookmakers, but you didn't mention hyperlinks. Um, information has been given to a practitioner that the CE filing bund bundles, uh, that CE filing bundles, sorry, removes the hyperlink. Is that something you're aware of um, and is it being addressed? Um, the answers, I think, are this. Yes, um, we do prefer them to be hyperlinked because um, obviously it does make life easier if you can hyperlink, but the bookmarks are more important as I've continued to use um, electronic bundles. The bookmarks are more important than hyperlinks. Hyperlinks do help, at least from the start when you're up at the index. Um, but I, I am aware of the problem with CE filing. It does remove them. It's to do with the way in which they're saved, I understand. I don't think there's anything they can do to change it. It's a very... Um, prescribed system is CE filing. It's not intended for what we're using it for. Um, the proper case management system is some way away, I think, um, and we're using it in a way which is probably um, not what the designers intended. Um, I would say this, that we are very flexible about bundles. Um, in, in, we as e-judiciary um, email holders can take um, files of up to, I think, 150 megabytes which is pretty much, I would imagine, almost every file um, that you can manage. Um, so that we're more than happy, um, I'm speaking, I'm sure, for all the judges um, to accept them by, um, connect, uh, by direct email um, if it's not working out well through CE filing. We'd like to CE filing just, to, just to, obviously because you have to, but we're quite happy and I would more than be happy to receive mine um, by direct link uh, or for connection by way of Dropbox or um, the equivalent safe um, egress or otherwise though for my own part I have some fun with egress it doesn't always work um, but we are flexible and we you know we want to be there we would like the best bundle we can and if the way in which it's um, appearing on C filing doesn't work um, we're happy to help um, in receiving it in a different way please feel free to contact um, I'm sure everyone knows the staff at these are wonderful um, and they will um, happily, I'm sure, find a way in which you can get the bundle across to uh, one of the judges in the way in which you created it, uh, rather than the way in which it might appear on CE filing. 
I think Jonathan might have something to add. Yeah, I just want to pick up on um, a couple of points Anish has, has made. Um, he is right that C5 isn't designed as a uh, system for lodging hearing bundles. Um, I, he is right too that um, if the um, protocols and systems allow and if the volume is uh, if the volume of the bundle allows as well, um, if C file can accommodate the bundles, then that is an option for you. Uh, Email is an option for you. But something I would encourage you to look at, um, and again, it's a point that Anish um, picked up on, uh, is uploading your uh, hearing bundles, particularly larger hearing bundles for trial, for example, to a secure data storage room. Uh, and then emailing the a link to the secure data storage room um, to uh, uh, to the staff or if the judge is prepared to accept to the judge him or herself um, uh, uh, because in my experience that is the easiest way to uh, get the bundle to the judge um, in the um, trial that um, Lisa has just been in um, and which she talked about there were for various reasons uh, uh, and quite understandably a number of iterations of the uh, trial bundle um, uh, and documents had to be added as the case proceeded. Um, the solicitors who were lodging the bundle in that case used their own data, secure data storage room and so that made it very easy for me for example to get access to the um, uh, to get access to the uh, updated uh, hearing bundle, the updated trial bundle, because they simply sent me a link um, to the bundle. I was up, uh, uh, I was able to download it relatively easily. Uh, as a paper hearing bundle, the bundle ran to about um, uh, 14 uh, lever arch files, but it didn't take uh, any time at all to download uh, uh, that way. So certainly, um, if it's otherwise permitted, C file or emailing, um, but really do have a look, if you haven't already, and I suspect most of you have, do have a look at secure data storage rooms uh, and email links as an option. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going, there isn't much time left, so I'm just going to pick out, there's a couple of practical questions here. Um, how does the court prefer um, without prejudice correspondence bundles to be dealt with? Maybe that's one for Judge Davis White. Um, and um, another one, is it okay for counsel to turn off their camera when their opponent is making submissions? Whilst Judge Davis White is turning on his microphone, I'll deal with the second of the questions. Um, uh, 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 yes, in, in my view, it is perfectly acceptable for for counsel to turn off their mic, their camera whilst their opponent is cross-examining. Um, it is, um, uh, uh, I would have thought, largely a matter for them. Um, a point that Eleanor has made, it, which I think is a more important one, is to make sure they are muted. It's very easy to forget um, that you're unmuted uh, and it is uh, embarrassing for you uh, if you can be heard both by the judge and your opponent commenting on something that uh, neither uh, uh, should hear. Uh, having said that, as we've successfully demonstrated this, this afternoon, um, when it is your time to talk, do make sure you unmute yourself. Uh, and now as the first question, over to an unmuted Judge Davis White. Well, now, now I'm unmuted, I, I shall let rip. No. Um... Uh, without prejudice, I mean, I think again, it's just a question of common sense and practicality. Um, I mean, probably the short short answer is to ask the judge at the, at the time of the hearing. Um, I mean, it depends when the point arises. Sometimes it, it may be appropriate to add it to an existing electronic bundle. Um, sometimes it, it may be a simply put it in a separate PDF. Um, I, I, I think one's just got to be very flexible. John, I don't know whether you've got any views on that. Uh, no, the, the I suspect. I, I, I imagine the difficulty is that um, uh, uh, it, it, the difficulty is the fear that a, the judge will look at without prejudice correspondence before the right time for the judge to, to be taken to the correspondence. Um, 
uh, if the point arises, I, I think Judge Davis White is right, discuss it with the judge. Um, certainly those of us who sit in leagues, more than happy to come up with practical solutions, direct emails at the right point, you know, at the right point in the proceedings um, uh, and the like. Um, these are practical issues which are not difficult to overcome. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just another practical one. Um, uh, this is about skeleton arguments and the length of them. Um, would it be help? Is it helpful to the judges perhaps to extend the twenty-page limit um, at, at this point in time? Um, and I just wondered if you had any comments on that. Um, can, can I chip in on that one first? Um, I, going back to my days in practice, I was sitting um, with the High Court judge on either side of me at a Chancery Bar dinner. So I turned to one, and then there remained nameless, but I turned to one and said, well, what is it you, you, know, you like in, in a skeleton argument? Oh, said the person sitting on my left, all I want is chapter headings. The skeleton argument should be longer than two pages, I just want the chapter headings as to what your arguments are. So I turned to the other judge, who's now Court of Appeal judge on the other side, and said, oh, skeleton arguments, you know, how do you how short do you like to be? Oh, he said, I like to be as full as possible with as much argument there so that I can see exactly all the arguments. And if I don't, if I'm not interested or whatever, I can just ignore those bits. But I'd rather have it all there set out for me so I can think about it in advance. So the short answer is, um, it's very much the eye of the beholder. Um, personally, I've only ever found um, rules such as 20 page limits or whatever uh, to be applicable when what is being provided is, is not helpful. Um, if in practice what is provided is sensible and helpful and it goes to 23 pages, it's unlikely anybody's going to raise a point upon it or it raise 25 pages. Um, it, it, it all depends on the particular case. And I, I think in personally, in line with the flexibility, um, I'm not even sure I was particularly aware that the 20 page had been imposed recently um, or fairly recently. Um, on the whole, you know, the skeleton arguments I get, whether they're long or short, seem to be um, uh, honed correctly to the sort of case I'm hearing. So I haven't really had any complaints one way or the other. So the short answer is keep doing what you're doing. From me, anyway. <laughs> Judge, for you any views? And Judge Beamer may as well. I, I was going to just post in, I, I think it really does depend on the type of hearing. I think um, if you're doing a, a, a trial, then a, a couple of a, a skeleton argument that is more towards the fleshy corpse um, level is, is worthwhile and useful. Um, what isn't useful is an incredibly long skeleton argument for an application where it takes you as long to read the skeleton argument as you would to the rest of the documents. I think you've got to be um, commensurate with the type of thing that you're doing. Um, I, I, and can, oh, sorry, and can I add, uh, I'm not sure that the fact that hearings are being, conduct, being conducted re remotely um, should affect the length of the skeleton argument. Um, I think what has been said is right. Um, uh, um, uh, the right skeleton argument for the right, the right length of skeleton argument for the type of hearing. Um, and whether it's remote or face to face probably doesn't make any difference. Uh, what, what I would make a plea for, I mean, most people do do this, but it's very helpful if right at the beginning, uh, you set out what order is or isn't being sought and broadly what your position is because there's nothing worse than a skeleton argument which just starts with the facts and you have to read about six pages before you understand what on earth the application is before you. So I, I'd simply make that point but it's a fairly obvious one. Thank you very much. Um, finally, um, there were a couple of questions um, around insolvency practice. Um, how will the courts deal with the winding up petitions presented whilst the current corporate governance and insolvency bill is in place? And will the court be asking for evidence with the petition to show the petition debt is unrelated to COVID-19 and so it can continue as usual? If so, will this evidence be considered on the papers in the normal company's court list or will there be individual remote hearings? Well, the Good news, uh, Stu, is that um, there is uh, coming up on, I think, the 6th of July, um, a um, full seminar, um, which is led, going to be led by the Vice Chancellor, um, who is very kindly online now watching us all. Um, 
and also um, by Claire Jackson, District Judge Claire Jackson. Um, so we're, we are devoting a whole seminar to that subject. Um, it is a very um, full and complicated subject. All I will say for present purposes, apart from please, please uh, look out for that forum and, and log in, um, is that the courts clearly are taking into account uh, the current bill. Um, there are uh, at least now two reported cases uh, on the point. Um, I myself had uh, a case um, for restraining presentation of a petition uh, where that issue arose, um, although I didn't have to deal with it substantively. Um, the Vice Chancellor, I think, has, has had one as well. Um, the um, fact that certain orders will be void um, means that the court is almost certainly going to be looking at that situation um, and uh, uh, considering very carefully whether or not to, to adjourn the petition uh, until after the uh, bill comes into force as an act uh, or what other step to take. But I, I think rather than uh, mislead you by um, giving a, a quick glib answer, the, the best thing to do is, as I say, um, to um, hold your questions uh, and wait for the very, very full and helpful seminar that is coming up shortly. Um, I don't think there is another winding up day in Leeds until about the 14th of July. Um, so in, in a sense, um, you will all be very well prepared for that hearing. So is there anything else on that front or other, any no, other fronts? No, we've, um, we've reached, uh, we're now at two minutes past seven. So we're officially finishing now. Um, I think you were going to say a few words to wrap it up. Say, I think so. Do you want fast answers to the ones that have been filed or do you want, uh, are you going to leave those, the other questions that have been filed? Um, I think most of them I, I did read out. There were just one or two that I didn't, which were more about the future really. So, um, yeah. Um, well, I, I, I'll, I'll just round up then. Um, first of all, thank you all for uh, attending. Um, can I thank all the panel very much uh, and again uh, Leeds Law Society. Um, and, and the Vice-Chancellor also for um, being uh, here and, and, and watching what was going on. Um, th this seminar was very much directed to some of the sort of practical issues that are arising in the current climate. Um, I'm aware that as well as questions, um, the insolvency questions, which, which I say I'm, I'm sorry to punt off to another full seminar, but it is a uh, very full topic that needs to be dealt with. Um, there have also been questions uh, about the longer term um, effect of COVID in terms of remote hearings and uh, to what extent COVID has accelerated um, a um, tendency towards remote hearings and will that tendency continue. Um, the Chancellor of the High Court has spoken on that on a number of occasions recently. Um, if people are interested um, and haven't heard that then it seems to me it may be useful if we try and arrange a seminar on that sort of topic as well. Um, and if you could perhaps um, write into uh, Leeds Law Society or, or Sue Harris and Catherine uh, and let them know, uh, or me or Jonathan or anyone else, um, that then we can uh, consider seeking to arrange uh, such an event. Um, but um, I don't think there's anything more other than to wish you all a very happy evening uh, and to thank you all once again. So goodbye. <laughs>